we're finally tackling the Project Zomboid Iceberg. With over 10 years of development dating back to the pre-alpha in 2011, there's a lot of history to unfold. With the Indie Stone being as transparent as they come, and a dedicated community supporting the game through its trials and tribulations, you amass the Project Zomboid Iceberg. After crawling through the web, Indie Stone forums, blogs, Zomboid Reddit, Steam pages and more, we pull it all together to walk through various aspects of the game. Let me know your ideas, corrections, theories, and thoughts all in the comments, but regardless, shout out to the two Reddit users who built their foundation, but let's get this started. There's an ongoing meme around the weapon meta, and that's whether if crowbars are better than axes compared to spears, and some players aren't even aware of this fact and they just use whatever they pick up. But hey, everyone's playthrough is going to be different, there's a few weapon tier lists floating out there. They each have their own benefits, but it just depends on what skills you focus on and what weapon you started out with. On the topic of gear, we'll start with the axe. Seen as a versatile tool, it may be better used to just to cut down trees to maintain its durability, but at some point in time it was nerfed back in build 41. This was in August of 2020, and at that time it did double the damage, but you can find the axe in a hardware store, park ranger truck, crates, fire station, which is a common location known to find the firefighter jacket and the firefighter pants. This gear set has some pretty decent stats, but they were also nerfed similar to the axe. Wearing them will slow you down, which is going to impact your combat speed and sprint speed, but if you want some similar protection, you can always look into the military jacket or the leather jacket, which offers some protection without it being a heavy set that will cause you to overheat and sweat while it also can't be repaired. Maybe it's more beneficial during the winter, but if you want more chest protection, you might as well go with the bulletproof vest. That protection was added in January of 2021 with a good scratch and bite resistance. Though when in a plain vanilla playthrough by yourself, there really is no need to protect yourself from bullets, but the vest still offers some utility. But it's not as useless as some of the unusable miscellaneous items in the game. From combs to crayons, basketballs, belts, and CDs, don't forget money and credit cards. But I wish there was a fat man equivalent to give these things purpose to just launch them off to zombies. Check your local toy store if you want to hoard some of this junk, but keep an eye out for the Spitho doll. While it's known as the Project Zomboid mascot and an adorable raccoon, it's actually an easter egg that originates from one of Indie Stone's games, Pause. This was intended to be a side-scrolling fighting game where all the characters had different powers, and in Project Zomboid you can see references to this today. In game, Mr. Spiffo is referenced as a fast food chain where he's the mascot, but before that, in Pause, Spiffo the raccoon was just a character that was going to steal items from other players. With said before the apocalypse, that action would get you sent to the Rosewood prison. As a point of interest, the prison is one of the more dangerous places in Knox County. The facility has a massive zombie population with cramped hallways, rooms, and many will try to challenge to clear out all the hordes. Other than those claiming this as a base in multiplayer, in a single player run, you can just go straight for the armory and use an emergency vehicle to create a distraction. I was shown what this looks like on the annotated map, but you can also use the map project to get a better understanding to plan your next run. We can thank Benjamin Schneider, also known as Blind Coder, for the map project, which essentially parses screenshots of the map together in a usable form. This was developed back in 2013, but as of today, we can see that it's linked on the Project Zomboid Indie Stone site as the official game map. Now, I can't speak on any controversy between now and then that got us to this point, but this just highlights the importance of the community. Transitioning from maps, we have Louisville. While this is now in build 41, this was a highly requested location to those playing prior builds. With every release comes a new shiny thing the community can fixate on, and as of today, that's going to be build 42, which includes farm animals and more. Overall, Louisville is a, one of the largest cities in Project Zomboid with a very high zombie population. Louisville isn't available as a spawn at the start since it's included to be one of the key narratives within the actual story behind the outbreak, but overall we'll touch on how it was included within the timeline of the exclusion zone before eventually being overrun. Similar to Louisville being a point of interest, March Ridge stands right by it. This is a military town that is further south on the map and is also known to be very dangerous as well. It's been released in 2016 back in Build 35 alongside Rosewood. There's a lot of mixed feedback if it's actually worth clearing out, but if you do find the annotated map for it, there's a jackpot of a decent amount of loot in the area. And with more loot comes trying to carry it all, which brings us to the hiking backpack. The large hiking bag was one of the best packs you can carry back in build 40 and below, but this has changed since today. There are a few iterations of bags in game, which all increase your carry capacity, but the main frustration comes to actually finding one. On screen, I have listed some of the top wearable backpacks you can shoot for, 
But either way, keep your eye out for one because you're going to need it. Now, once you've gathered your loot and you're finding a place to stay, you may want to consider doing a zombie burn just to clear the area. Similar to a controlled burn within forestry, you get all your zombies together, gather them with a car siren, and just use a campfire or a molotov to light them all together. Most importantly, you want to make sure you watch them all burn on screen since they can wander and set fire to other neighboring buildings, including your base. Now with the basics of base management comes sheets to cover your windows. You can't see in and you can't see out. This prevents light from getting in or zombies from seeing you as well. And as a side note, don't forget about sheet ropes on your second floor. With the devs being a fan of Max Brooks' zombie survival guide, step 6 of the lesson starts with getting up the staircase and then destroying it. Definitely something you can do if you find yourself a sledgehammer. Within your base, you can kill time with media. And this is in the form of VHS tapes, CDs, but this wasn't added until September 15th of 2021. They all have different types of spawns and can be seen in houses more frequently, but they all have recipes to help level up your character and boost your abilities. On screen, here are a few of the most helpful ones. Now, if you played the Build 41 tutorial level, you will find out that Q is to yell, which definitely attracts zombies. There is no antidote, but you can use Q to yell to attract zombies. While you're crouched, Q can whisper so you can actually target certain zombies to isolate and use it to pump your horn when you're in a car. You can even unbind Q since if you hold the same key, you can bring up the radial menu to do the same thing. Definitely a safer option for those who don't want to make a mistake during their playthrough. But while you're creeping through and you come across a zombie unknowingly, jump scares are definitely a thing. Hopefully your audio isn't too loud since it's typically met by a high pitched sound which still gets me till this day. A few mods out there exist if you don't enjoy it if you want to switch with the noise, but it's seen as a notorious feature in the game. With most default runs, you can run into crawlers, but sprinters could also be added into the game or certain challenge maps. As of today, this is something we can modify in the sandbox, but in the past, they were introduced into the game by default, which caused some controversy and feedback, which the devs listened to. On the other hand, the Indie Stone can't listen to exactly everything. NPCs were once in the game at some point in time, but were taken out in maybe 2015 or 2016. I can't speak on behalf of all the reasons, but there were some technical challenges in place and some dependencies with Build 41's animation overhaul. Either way, you can't blame the developers for not wanting to release a feature that they don't feel is polished enough to be in the full game. This is where the community has to trust back in the devs and just agree with the roadmap they set place. We might see NPCs in Build 43, but only time will tell. With Project Zomboid being a continuously evolving project, there's always going to be a new flagship build or a new story that everyone's going to be anchored onto. Depending on when you're watching this, who knows what the next build is going to be that everyone's on the lookout for. Level 2 starts off with the story behind Bob and Kate. The game's original tutorial took place with the players controlling Bob to help nurse his wife back into good condition. Here I'm running an alpha version of the game as a demonstration, but their story helped introduce the players to the mechanics in addition to the crew world of Project Zomboid. You can still access their original home up in Muldrar, but the most jarring fact is that Bob in fact turned and is found eating Kate on the splash screen of Project Zomboid. If you look closely once the lightning strikes, you'll find that he's in fact eating her and not quite consoling her as we once thought. Within the title screen, we could also see a credit to Zack Beaver known as the 16-year-old composer for the original Project Zomboid music. Back in 2012, you can also see a blog post dedicated to his work. With in-game media, you have Life and Living. This is one of the main channels that broadcast on a schedule that will help boost your character's skills just by watching it. July 9th at 9am is the default start time for most playthroughs, so you will miss an episode or two if you're looking at the schedule. But one of the first things I typically do is grab a watch off a zombie and set my alarm clocks to make sure I schedule my loot runs and objectives around the episodes. The start time can easily be changed in your sandbox, but always make sure you grab a fast learner in addition. Similar to the radio or TV generating a noise, you can actually make a noisemaker seen as a trap to attract zombies as a distraction. In 2015, when Build 32 was released, this came with the two new professions of electrician and engineer, in addition to traps. Requiring level 3 electrical and the engineer magazine, you could create your own noisemaker with some an amplifier and some scrap. Now if you don't have any of those things, you could always just use an alarm clock to do the same. And if you're looking for a self-inflicting trap, bleach will always be there. 
It can be used to clean up blood stains within your base or just poison yourself or poison food for others. Drinking a whole bottle will cure your thirst, but it's 100% guaranteed to end your playthrough with 120 poison and 99 unhappiness. On the opposite end, if you do come across the katana, there's no reason to end your gameplay. It's known as one of the highest damage output weapons in the game, and you can definitely clear out hordes with no issue. You might be lucky to find it in a survivor's house or in a gun shop, but it can't be repaired, so be sure to make sure you have your long blade leveled up before wielding it. Within the same topic of high tier loot, the M16 is one of the best firearms you can get within the vanilla game itself. While it may have been a bit more OP in the past and it has been balanced today, it does offer a wide range of attachments, fire modes, with the ability to pierce through targets. It can be found in the military bases, armories, or the military camp by Louisville. Now you're going to want to level up your aiming and reloading skills to make proper use of your firearms, but one creative way you can do so safely is through rolling your window down and just doing a drive-by. You won't be able to steer while shooting, so make sure you line up your shots before you pull the trigger. Most players may not know that you could push zombies out the way before stepping out the car. Once you roll your windows down, you can just click out the screen as if you're trying to melee, which pushes them and gives them some distance before you could get out and make your escape. While having a car is a pretty important resource, they used to be even more OP as vehicle barricades. Before Build 41 was introduced, all you had to do was set your perimeter up with a few cars and you had an impenetrable fortress. Regardless of where your base is, you're going to have to account for the water shutting off within the first 30 days. Water barrels can also be known as rain collector barrels. Either way, they can hold up to 20 bottles of water if you have yourself a plastic bag, a few nails and planks, and carpentry level 7 and this is absolutely crucial if you want to make it further in your playthrough. There are a few options of ones you can create, but once you place these on your roof, you can get your plumbing going again. Now, most bases either have an oven or a microwave. You want to remember never to break the cardinal sin of leaving the house with the oven on or putting metal in the microwave. This is two easy ways to start a kitchen fire and burn down your base. On the topic of mods, Hydrocraft is, was a pretty popular mod for Project Zomboid that added a wide range of items, crafting recipes, and new gameplay mechanics. Similar to RGM and Brita's armor pack, there's plenty of mods that do the same. In the earlier builds, this was huge since it included things like farming, fishing, and trapping before they were introduced within the stable version. Now, if you wanted to expand into your vanilla world, there's the Raven Creek mod, which adds a whole new port and a city for you to explore. This was a notable map expansion as a huge city since it was here before Louisville was released. As you drive around, you may have noticed that a lot of the roads typically have a 90 degree turn at some point. This probably has resulted in you crashing, spinning out, or just running into a tree. This has been acknowledged by the devs and there's a whole blog post talking about the addition of new tiles to have more natural 45 degree transitions to help avoid players crashing. While you might break a bone in a crash, this is completely different between the two types of infections in Project Zomboid. If you're scratched or cut from a non-zombie related injury, that's definitely survivable if that does become infected. You just have to go ahead and treat that with antibiotics, disinfectant, and just tend to that injury until you're healed. On the other hand, if you are scratched or wounded by a zombie, there is a chance of zombification. 7% chance from a scratch, 25% chance from a laceration, and 100% chance from a bite. After getting bitten, you have about three days to live. Things start with the anxiety building up, you find your character getting queasy and nauseous, but once the fever is approaching, you'll find yourself with terminal damage until death ends your run. And for those who don't want to say goodbye to their run, there are a few backup utility options floating around out there that just let you back up your game and restore from any date. This one's from Mr. Nekoromu, but there are plenty floating around out there. Level 3 will start with the term Thursdoid. The phrase was coined by the Indie Stone development team since they would release their updates on a Thursday. In the past, in 2013, this was done on Monday, so Mundoid, but overall, as of today, check their page for the latest news. To get the mods out the way, we have Bedford Falls and Cherbourg. Both of these are huge map expansions that you can find in the workshop, which just adds more zones to your gameplay. We can see where they fall into place on screen, but if you're looking for a cheat mod without having to go into debug mode, you have Necroforge. It's a cheat mod with a very simple UI where you can just add some items to your character and do a lot more. Though mods are fun, the default game does make things interesting with the sadistic AI director. 
Things like waking up with nightmares, the helicopter event, or just weird meta events in games like screams and dogs barking that attract zombies to the locations. All these are randomized to make the game more interesting. You'll only come across a single helicopter event if you're playing normally, but if you jump into the sandbox, you could always tweak some of these settings if you want to make your game more interesting. Hearing the dogs barking always hinted to some that dogs might be something we'll see in the later versions, but as of today, it could only be done through mods. Maybe Build42 could be the first site, but either way, dogs are currently not in Project Zomboid. This is also similar to the feature of amputated limbs. There's no prosthetics currently, but amputation is something that might be seen in later versions. Could be seen as a negative trait to take starting out, or even a method to avoid infection by just removing a limb. Either way, currently not in game, but for those looking to put their skills to the test, the CDDA challenge is definitely there. Inspired by the really bad day challenge within Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead, the scenario description is pretty accurate. You get out of the shower, you're drunk, you have a cold, and your house is on fire. Zombie population is pretty high, and you just have to figure it out with glass lodged in your foot. While we don't know what they drank to get that drunk in the first place, bourbon or any other alcohol can be used as a disinfectant to make sterilized rags and just clean your wounds. Alcohol can also work similar to painkillers, beta blockers, or sleeping tablets. The most important rule here is to never mix alcohol and sleeping pills, because you will probably never wake up in game. Oh, the realism. And on that note, be sure to never run a car or a generator within a closed space. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a real thing, and that's another way to just end your life. On a brighter note, even when the water supply is shut off, you can still rely on finding a well for a consistent source. I have a few locations on screen, but there is a mod for well construction as well. Lastly, we're going to touch on old combat. This just shows how much of a leap of quality Build 41 created, since there is a huge difference in how the game felt and looked with Build 40. We have some side-by-side -side gameplay of what that used to look like, but if we go back in time even further and revisit the alpha build, version 0.1.4 shows a completely different game. This goes back to the old tutorial with Bob and Kate, which helps us get our footing, but shows us how far we've come. Level 4 kicks off with dedication and hard work receiving the proper recognition. This is a reference to the Indie Stone developers getting a shout out within the Minecraft splash screen. Then again, Mojang started off as an indie company, they're both developing in Java, and they're both making survival games, so it only seemed right. Bad things do happen to good people, which brings us to the developers getting robbed. In the early development stages, they were set behind by about a month with three computers getting stolen. There's a Reddit thread that covers this, but this was a big hit to morale, and the community misunderstood the situation. Back to the context of in-game, if you pay attention to the radio and the news stations, it'll start to uncover the lore of what exactly happened behind the outbreak. SQC covers this timeline, so I'll link his video in the description. An interesting fact is that a player can also come across a stash by accident. Stashes can be hidden in floorboards inside a house, so if you come across some creaking sound, check the floorboard tiles carefully to see if there's some hidden loot you can uncover. Now if you caught Woodcraft on Life and Living, you may have noticed that the Woodcraft guy is very selective with his words. While he helps you level up your carpentry, he can't do it without mentioning his tight pants, taking his shirt off, and making beds for the ladies. On screen I have a script of what you might see, but there's a really good animation done that I'll link in the description as well for this. There is no Moodle to describe the Woodcraft guy, there were a few that were removed from the game. There used to be an angry Moodle and a hungover Moodle in the earlier versions, but who knows what can be coming in the future. There are many easter eggs scattered throughout the game. There are buildings referencing pop culture like Better Call Saul, a Friday the 13th reference when you come across Jason as a zombie with all his gear, in addition to a house full of toilet paper as if it was the pandemic. Things can always change, similar to how Knox Country was previously called Knox County before it was renamed in 2013. This was simply an error that Indy Stone addressed. And on that final note, the ambulance was once known to be an OP vehicle. Even though it doesn't hold six seats anymore, it has the highest horsepower out of all the Franklin van types. Even though all the base vans except the six-seater have 130 units of space in the back, the post office van is the next exception with 160. Horny modders is exactly how you'd think of it. When you give people free will, you never know what you're going to get out of it. And here's just a collection of a few of the horniest mods within the workshop. Explore these on your own time. Figured they'd definitely earn a spot here. It's okay if you want to add nudity for your realism. We get it.
We all know the game could be a bit of a grind, and with default settings, one day-night cycle is one hour in real time. Making it to a month and less than a month is basically a full-time job, so just make sure you're eating better and getting more sleep than your character is in Project Zomboid. Of all the vegetables you can grow, cabbage is probably the most superior. It offers the highest nutritional value, only takes 10 days to grow, with the only drawback of the shortest shelf life, of 2 days to going stale and 2 days additional to rotting. It's definitely seen as the end game meta as one of the best vegetables to live off of. As we enter level 5, things start to get weird with the old ham texture. Call it poor design choice of the sprites, but it just looked like a dick. There's a single mod keeping this image alive if you want to download it for yourself and relive the past, but there you go. On the opposite end, the plank barricade used to look very clean and polished when they were put up, almost too perfect. But as of today, they changed this to have a more of a rugged look. In the current game, ice cream can melt, and then if it eventually melts past the point of no return, it's considered rotten. Some of the unhappiness and boredom modifiers were addressed if you were to eat ice cream in certain states, but either way, just keep it in the freezer. Now we enter the story of Telecorn. It all started with a Reddit user mentioning that they ate some corn and it teleported them to a whole new location. Even a member from the Indie Stone commented in, hinting that it was actually intentional, but it just further confused everyone and now it's just an on-running joke. To this day, we don't know if Telecorn's real or if there's a likelihood that you can be teleported, but the story of Telecorn lives on. With trees, they can be considered deadly since you can eventually cut yourself on the trees and bleed out to a degree, or just find yourself walking through trees and then bump into a whole horde. Now there are mods for vehicle armor and new vehicle classes with armor sets you can build on with metal crafting, but this has been in the talks. Maybe we'll see this in the future. Till now, there's plenty of mods in the workshop for that. On that note, you have the mod for bikes and boats. Boat mod is definitely necessary if you're trying to get over the river for the map expansion, but both of these completely switch up the gameplay. While chainsaws and snipers have been things that people want, mods do exist to bring them in, but these are considered to be some of the unused, unimplemented weapons in the game. We don't know when we'll see them, but they might come in the future. If you went to the prison during an earlier build, you might notice that the zombies in the prison were actually in civilian clothes. It brings up some conspiracies on how they got there in the first place, but this was addressed by the devs in a patch, which pretty much updated zombies in the prison to actually be in prison clothes. Now, if you're looking to experiment, develop, or see some of the behind the scenes work that make up Project Zomboid, there is a debug mode available for you. All it takes is just right clicking the Product Zomboid properties within Steam and then passing the dash debug flag. And then at startup, you'll be welcome to a few new options available to you on screen. You can access new scenarios that places your character in the world for testing or mess around with some in-game options when you load yourself in. Regardless of whether you're a dev or not, I would just recommend poking around just to see what's going on. And the last piece of interesting context is that books can cure a lot. Within the category of literature, you have magazines, crosswords, porno mags, and more. And all of these simply just reduce boredom, stress, and unhappiness, which is a strong factor that you have to battle against in Project Zomboid. Hence, books curing all ailments to a degree. Level 6 starts off with the idea of Project Zomboid as an MMORPG. While this is an ambitious project that may have been a little far-fetched before, we're getting closer to this vision thanks to Atomic Duck and his Patreon supporters. I would suggest to check out his YouTube page where he has a few videos documenting what could be done and the work necessary to make this happen. While there's always work to be done, glitches and bugs are never unavoidable. There's been moments where players can come across a void where everything is black and some chunks aren't loaded into the map. Almost as if you reached the end of the world and there's nothing else going forward. Similarly, some players may run into a line of traffic cones, also that might be pointing to the same thing. Similar to the Day 9 media collapse. If you haven't noticed, by Day 9 you're not going to catch any new TV scheduled shows within the game. Things like Life and Living, some news channels and so on. Things seem to just go dark after Day 9. Say goodbye to your favorite shows and just hoard those VHS tapes. Hopefully you're hoarding a lot more because you never know when either electricity or water is going to shut off. There's been times where there's been instant water shut off and you start the game with no water whatsoever. If you jump into the sandbox settings, you'll notice that water and electricity can be shut off between zero to 30 days. So always be prepared. 
On the contrary, if you are out of power, you don't have a generator, and you're trying to shine some light into your house, you could always take a car, park it with the headlights facing your home, and just turn on those headlights. It'll shine through those windows and provide some light within your house. Now, light bulbs do break over time, just as they do in real life, so hopefully this could be a method to work around that aspect. But that's also mentioned on the iceberg as a notable fact, since sometimes you can hear the sound of light bulbs breaking, signifying that that light needs to be replaced. Now, replacing a bulb is no different than just simple maintenance and mechanics on things like your vehicle and even your generator. Now, if you don't maintain your generator, you can risk an explosion. It only takes a few electronic scraps to repair it, so always be sure to check the condition of your generator when running. And for the elusive topic of things eventually coming to the game or things that have been in the talks, you have fire trucks, military vehicles, and then basements and sewers. As you already know, there's always going to be mods for a lot of these, so I'll put a few of them on screen. But there were some mentions of basements and some of the recent dev blogs from the Indie Stone. Dev blogs are one, but you can always look at the pzwiki.net to look at some of the balance changes when it comes to in-game updates. Prime example, the spears used to be extremely OP. There's been a few balance changes to it over time, but in the past, at level 0, you could kill at least 15 to 20 zombies before it breaking, compared to the 2 to 3 kills you get now. Still, they do a decent amount of damage, they have some good distance, you can charge them, and use them for spear fishing. If you played the King's Mouth challenge that was introduced in build 41, this was actually Actually inspired by a workshop map that was built in 2018. And this map is the island built by Wildren, who also bought you over the river and a few other notable ones. And now, level 7. We'll begin with the erosion effects. The term erosion in Product Zomboid refers to the in game mechanic that simulates just the passage of time and impact on the environment. This could be things within the game world like road conditions, vegetation and growth, building decay accumulation of dirt and debris, which all just give a sense of realism. This didn't exist in the original game, but like many things, it all started with a mod that was developed, which was eventually brought into the game. That mod was released back in 2013 by the developer of Turbo Two-Tone. Similar to a lot of the other devs with great work, he was eventually brought onto the team in 2014. With other in-game mechanics, we have the zombie horde dynamics. While there were some theories on how the hordes were provoked, what we do know today is that they are engaged by sound and sight. There are some mods where zombies can smell blood, but within the default vanilla game, if we jump into debug mode, here I'll spawn a huge horde of a thousand, and I'll teleport myself away from them. What I can do is just signal a world sound that will alert the zombies within a specific radius, and you can see that all those zombies will then start moving to that location. So that's why things like car alarms or any sounds are very sensitive within Project Zomboid. We can see on screen with the zombie population, as I run through, all these zombies start to spot me and continue traveling. But the idea is that sometimes there's a horde master where all these zombies will just follow one zombie, which provoke them into becoming one big horde. If we spawn a small horde, we can see them immediately get attracted by the group, but we're not sure if that's by sound or just in-game mechanics. While this is behind the scenes, there are a lot of intricate in-game details the player comes across. One being that there's an emergency broadcast station that actually lets you know when the in-game helicopter event is coming. If you're tuned in to the emergency broadcast station, you'll hear that there is some air activity detected, giving you a warning that the helicopter is coming, so you better just plan that whole day to stay inside. In addition, there are a few randomly generated hidden radio channels you could find by just tuning the radio to different channels. You can find ranges of civilians talking to the military and so on. Overall, just seen as additional Easter eggs in game that keep things interesting. On the topic of Easter eggs that keep things interesting, we could take a look at the Project Zomboid tutorial. Though the player is meant to fail with this unique approach on teaching ones the mechanics and controls of the game, if we jump to debug mode, we could see a few hidden buildings that the player wouldn't typically run into. One being a secret lab with a computer, two scientists, and a mural to Spiffo himself, which is very interesting. And another cabin that's also a morgue, almost the perfect environment for patient zero. While hidden buildings are cool, I don't think they have anything on a double toilet. This was simply a bug where bathrooms and toilets some would sometimes face each other. One interesting fact is that you can technically stay awake forever in-game. If you do reach peak drowsiness, you'll be doing 95% less damage, but if you really just wanted to stay awake forever, you could do so without any issues. You just need to make sure your hunger and thirst is maintained and you can stay awake as long as you want. In addition to being immune to sleep, your character is also immune to the airborne infection. Hinted at the lore, the virus is airborne, which turned a lot of the people into zomboids, but your character is actually immune to this fact. While the airborne strain 
doesn't affect you, you are still susceptible to the actual virus. There are a few mods that add airborne as a factor where you have to wear N95 mask or some makeshift ones to add another layer of immersion to, into your game. But currently the only sandbox settings with infection comes through saliva or just being bitten. The infection is one, but the source has some conspiracies behind it. You can browse Reddit to read some of the fan theories, but one in particular is that the virus originated from the meat provided from Spiffo. The government covered up the virus and also tried to weaponize this as well, and everything's gone wrong from that. I'm not going to go into the rabbit hole, but there's some talks of alien infestation, meteor victims, spreading, causing the players to be immune. You can read it for yourself and just go with whatever makes you feel happy. If you do come up with any theories, don't forget to explore the military base before doing so. In game, this is known to be the only place with actual computers in addition to abandoned kennels. If we don't have dogs, why are there kennels in the first place? Could go back to another theory with where the virus came from. In addition, this is one of the only places where we can see a computer in game. Next is the light switch noise bug. I did some testing and this doesn't exist today. The theory was that at night, if you were to switch on your light switch, it would also broadcast a noise within some radius that would attract zombies to your location. Since zombies couldn't be light sensitive, this was a workaround to do so. But, but after jumping into debug mode and just doing a few tests here, this is not the case today. And we finally made it to level eight where we'll get things kicked off with the Kentucky Goblin and Project Zomboid. What we know today is the Goblin Dog also originated as a real story in real life. The Kentucky Goblin story is a supposed encounter with a small green light goblin creature in Kentucky back in 1995. The creatures were allegedly seen by people and were said to cause a disturbance at night before disappearing. In game, this can be seen as an easter egg pointing to the actual goblin dog story. And if you were to actually watch the goblin dog VHS stories, it's one of the few that will actually cause your character some negative experiences. If you want to know more about the dog goblin story, Crazy FYI covers this pretty well within his series on VHS tape lore. With there being references to inside jokes and content creator runs like Gerald Williams, we're going to talk about Keith. The only things we know about Keith is that he's a firefighter, he killed 128 zomboids with his hands, and he is laid out in this picture. It all started with an obscure Reddit post, but we don't know too much about Keith. The in-game, there's a VHS reference to Keith's big birthday. And even this month, there were some references to the NPC narratives. We can even see a mention to the smoke getting to Keith, but they were able to drag him out. Not sure if the Indie Stone is acknowledging this, but I'll let you decide. The story of Keith. Overall, the one thing we do know in game is that you are alone. Sometimes you hear screams or gunshots, even dogs barking. But as you play through a solo run, you don't come across anything. Your character is simply alone in this wasteland trying to live another day. With said, we may not really think about the perspective of the characters we're playing as. Constantly just trying to survive, take out hordes with adrenaline pumping 24-7? It's psychotic. It's an interesting thought to ruminate on, and there's a mod out there to become desensitized that leans into this thought as well. Once you hit maybe 500 kills, your character no longer is panicked, and can essentially outgrow some negative traits, similar to exposure therapy. After all, killing zombies does reduce stress and boredom. Here we can see a quick test of me maxing the two out, and after a few swings of the axe, I'm already feeling better. While there is no official cure for the infection, and there never will be, there were some theories floating around about a small percentage of survival even if you were bit. I don't believe this still applies today, but there are mods that allow you to actually go out and build a cure. If you haven't seen it already, Arian covers this beautifully in a Project Zomboid film on his journey to find the cure. This brings additional speculation for who exactly is Patient Zero. This is just another question that we'll never have the answer for. The game doesn't exactly have the set storyline of a character that it relates back to being the Patient Zero who started it all, but it leaves you to wonder to where they are today, who it may be, and if we can find signs of them in the map. Nonetheless, the fan theories live on. One historical fact is that there was military presence in Knox County in the early 1990s. There was the Bluegrass Army Depot, which stored ammunition and chemical weapons, and this was approximately 40 miles southwest of Knox County. There wasn't any nuclear testing done in Kentucky that we know of till date, but the first nuclear testing in the US was done in 1992, approximately one year before the Product Zomboid timeline begins in 1993. Within the default sandbox settings of Project Zomboid, there is no real end. Zombies will continue to spawn as your character moves on, and there really is no means of survival. At the end of the day, this is the story of how you died. In a different world, if we were to turn off spawns and zombie decay was the thing, there could be an end in theory. Of course, this requires you to actually wipe out the entire zombie population yourself, but I'm sure there's someone out there who's done it. 
Now on a brighter note, if we were to look at the Pizza World in-game restaurant, this actually refers to the Flash game Papa's Pizzeria. It uses the same color scheme, but just interesting to see the reference for this. Now if we take a deeper look, we're going to see that Project Zomboid was not always hosted on Steam. Before Steam came along, Desura was known as a community-driven distribution service for gamers, and it mainly appealed to indie companies to promote smaller games while also featuring mod creators for others to also jump in and start modding games. This was well before Steam had the workshop. Eventually, Steam did put Desora out of business, and the Indie Stone had to move everyone over to Steam. This wasn't easy for them since Desora fell off the face of the earth and left with the proof of purchase for a lot of the original supporters, so it made it pretty hard to really validate who actually bought the game with those trying to impersonate real buyers to get a free game key. Multiple acquisitions later, Desora just hosts Flash games today. Not sure if this is related to Papa Pizzeria, but Flash games just like itself. If you're gonna go check out the pizza shop for yourself in game, there's a chance you may have picked up the Speed Demon trait. While it's a positive one, it can be seen as a negative trait in the long run. While you can go fast, which could also make you more prone to accidents, Speed Demon allows you to go faster, which means your car can access higher RPMs. The higher the RPM, the louder your engine. But with some testing seen by Retinaru, the main negative effect is if you are reversing. As you reverse, you're going to reach a higher RPMs, which means your car is going to be louder than normal in this state. It's suggested to avoid reversing while using Speed Demon at all costs, but if you're just driving normally, make sure to use your cruise control and to check your engine condition to see what the engine loudness is at. Do check out his channel for some of his analysis within game. As the community continues to support the game in a multitude of ways, the Indie Stone always makes a way to show their appreciation. Whether that's working with some YouTubers or bringing modders on board to the team, there's probably so much that we're not even aware of that has made the game what it is today. Here we can jump into the main screen Lua script that generates a lot of the text we see within the main menu to see special thanks to a few creators like Robas, who was playing the game eight years ago in its earliest stages, others like Atomic Duck, Private Lime, Ambiguous Amphibian, and plenty of more. I'm gonna leave a few of it on screen if you wanna look for yourself, but this just shows the care that the Indie Stone has with the game itself. Lastly, if you haven't seen it already, I highly suggest you to watch the Indie Stone panel on how to not make a game. Even though this video was 10 years old, it still gives transparency and vulnerability on all the things they went through just to put out Project Zomboid. Regardless, I hope to see them revisit this format about their successes and failures today. And that wraps it up. Big thanks to everyone in the community who makes Project Zomboid what it is today, but I was happy to go through this history lesson here. Hopefully you learned a thing or two, but feel free to show your support with a subscribe and a like. Thanks and have a good one.